Welcome to Revitalize and Replant. My name is Tom Rayner. I am joined by Kevin Ezell, the president of the North American Mission Board. Just a word, Revitalize and Replant is sponsored by the North American Mission Board and churchreplanters.com. I encourage you, I urge you to look at all the information that uh, churchreplanters.com has, as well as nam.net, incredible organization, just to name a few things they're doing, church planting, evangelism, disaster relief, church replanting, church revitalization. They're all about healthy churches, and we're honored at Church Answers to partner with them on Revitalize and Replant. Kevin, we started a series last episode for for our listeners and viewers last week called Leading a Low Commitment Church to Becoming a High Commitment Church. We gave some of the background, how they got that way. Today, we're going to focus on leaders, how leaders can be more effective in leading their church to high commitment. But you said that you have a list for us, so I'm I'm ready to, (laughs) I'm ready to listen to your list. Yeah, we've all got lists, but it's always best to keep those to yourself. But oh man, the the great anticipation of uh, last week, we're going to give a list of ineffective, ineffective churches. Well, I I know we, we uh, lose about six or 700 a year in the SBC. So, you know, there you go. Go look at the list. Of those. Go look at the list. It's there. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. OK, this whole idea of becoming a low expectation church, low commitment church and moving to become a high commitment. If you didn't hear our first episode in this, go back one week and listen to that, because Kevin and I talked about the background of how churches went from low commitment to high commitment. Now, as Kevin and I are want to do at times, we got off the trail just a little bit. Uh, usually it was my fault. I got off the trail of college football. <laughs> I started talking about Helen Reddy's song, Delta Dom. What's that flower you have on? And I just went into a little bit different categories. And then Kevin pulls us back and says, let's, let's get back to the topic. I'll focus on this one to begin. So. Part two of leading a low commitment church to become a high commitment church is leading leaders to high commitment. I'm going to make a statement that is so profound in its simplicity that it almost is not worth saying, but I will. If you're going to have a high commitment church, leaders must set the example, Kevin. Absolutely. It starts. And the thing is, you can't change anyone else, but you can change you. You know, and that's why I tell guys, well, my church won't change. Well, look, start with one. Yes. You you and, and it's like that that old uh, that old evangelist uh, Gypsy Smith once I asked, "How do you start revival? How do you really change someone?" He goes, "Well, you go into a room all by yourself. You get a piece of chalk. You draw a circle on the floor with the piece of chalk, and you get down on your knees in that circle and pray that God would start a revival in the circle." And I really think that's the best way to change your church to high uh, capacity is to get down in the circle and say, "Look, I'm going to start with me." And because so often a church is reflective of its leader and uh, start with you and then start with one other and just go from there, build a, a core team. And then you can do it. You can pull it out of a ditch with just two or three effective guys. You, uh, probably not going down the best path to make you and me the heroes of our own story. But we have talked about our first churches that weren't just low expectation. Both of our first churches were dead. Yeah. And, my church, they had to decide between calling me or closing the doors. And after hearing me preach, they were still really confused about which path they wanted to go. But your church in Texas was just like that. Exactly. All seven of them. Mm -hmm. Mine was seven until the Rainer family of then four joined them. Jess was not yet born. And so we we had 11. But uh, you you went in and said, I'm going to be the example. And you've never said that boastfully. You've just said it with all of your idiosyncrasies and fault problems and faults, but you said it as well. Right. man. And honestly, you just try to infuse it. And that, that's why my joke is I always go back to Cracker Barrel, but it's my, I did it relationally where I just tried to, man, I just invested in people, spent time with people, I enjoy being with them. And, you know, I sat through a lot of dirt track races in Nashville and went to frog gigging with with some of my deacons. I really want I did that so I could do the other. And some pastors just don't want to pay the the cost of the relational investment, you know, and went to man, I went to many. I, I was just in 
uh, my very first church, Hartsville, Tennessee, first full-time church, I just went by the old cattle auction. I used to go there every Tuesday and and hang out with some of my my members who were farmers. And uh, man, it just almost brought me to tears in thinking of being so young and excited and go there and hang out in the smell of that manure, trying to disciple those guys. And they didn't even know it, you know, I would, I, I'm sorry. I wouldn't know. <laughs> hey, it, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. You gotta wear, you gotta wear jeans, a flannel. I put a, I put a Tootsie roll uh, right here. <laughs> that, was your, I, that was your backy. That would fit in. Yeah. I fit in with all the other guys. They got the biggest kick out of it. I really did do that. And uh, they, they thought that was so funny. And so when the drool came out, it was brown. Just like <laughs> it was brown. Background. Yeah. I had a styrofoam cup and, and those, those farmers say, you know, but <laughs> you had a styrofoam cup. I had a styrofoam cup. <laughs> and, and, and they did, they did the same thing you're doing. And, but what I did try to communicate to them is look, I'm trying here, you know, uh, I, I'm doing the best, best I can. I, I did learn you don't wear khakis. And uh, that's not a sweater vest environment. You got to go flannel. But but my point was, those guys had a way of doing things. I, I had to get I had to connect with them in, in another way so that they would actually let me lead them, you know, at the at the church in a way. So when I went to Highview, I did the same thing. I joined a bowling league. I think I've told that before, and and uh, connected with my some of my key leaders, and then just kind of relationally walked them and discipled them a different way to be more effective in some other areas. And, and uh, I'm just grateful. It, it really did get traction, but you got to make an investment to do this. It's not going to just happen. It's my point. Yeah. I remember investment I made with a church member from Birmingham when I was there, I used the condo on the beach. Hey, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Really in debt yourself to them, you know, use their condo. <laughs> use their condo on the beach. That's, uh, but he was very gracious and very generous. But yeah, leaders must set the example. And if you are a low commitment church, don't expect your church to have any semblance of being a high commitment. And Kevin, you brought up something that I hear so frequently. Well, my church just won't fill in the blank. They won't do this or yeah. whatever. And you know, I, I, I just have. And sometimes it's a staff person who says the pastor won't, or the pastor says the staff won't. It's the same story. That circle. Get the chalk. No, absolutely. And that's just an excuse. You know, you can, you can, you just have to, you lead it and you do it. My church won't. And if they won't, then you do it by yourself. And then eventually you'll get a guy to do it. Or somebody will come along and, and then you'll begin to multiply. And you just got, you have to lead. And the idea of leading, you know, you're not the leader by default, typically. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah, you, you you lead and then people will follow. Two of the guys that uh, I had closer discipleship relations, uh, one was Steve at my first church and the third, and then another one was my church in St. Pete and his name was Van. They both came, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with them. They both became followers of Christ. Their sanctification was slow on the profanity <laughs> side. And it, and I've told the story before about Steve, who I made the only church greeter at my first church, the only church greeter. And and a couple came in that had never been to the church for country church before. And they were wide eyed and I knew something was up. And I said, you know, welcome. They said, well, that's some kind of greeter you have out there. Well, he was greeting them by saying, how the, are you? And, and <laughs> oh, my word. I had to. Oh. So so two, two of my discipleship processes was. Um, Deep profanitizing in in discipleship for for St for Steve and Van, but you know it's just not a thing for those guys though. I mean, I, I remember I remember exactly where I was set at Cracker Barrel on Blankenbaker Road. I remember that Cracker Barrel. Yeah, and I was sitting there with a guy that just came to know Christ, just laid to Christ, and I I said it was our very first time to get together. I said, hey, just tell me what what do you think's what you one of your biggest challenges? And he goes, you know, he was thinking real hard. I went, no, 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 no. He said, well, your biggest challenge would be something just obvious. Let's just think of a, an easy gimme put here. Let's just start with one area that you think we could work on. He, goes, he started thinking real hard. And I said, no, 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 no. You're thinking too hard. And he said, damn, Pastor, I can't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, since you've, since you've already gone on and used the Friday, I'll just say he was greeting people by saying, how the hell are you? And that is not a good opening at a church you know no yeah throw me under the bus saying now that kevin's already gone ahead and said 
<laughs> well, I think it, I think our listeners and viewers will understand. I'm discipling you. They, they know what we were saying anyway. You yeah. weren't having anything. You mentioned point number two in the first episode, and I really want to you you listeners and viewers to go back to that first episode because Ke- Kevin said something that I know he's probably said most of his ministry, but for us who are hearing it, it's a great phrase. Talk about selective preaching, because number two is preaching without equivocation. What what do you mean when we say some of the leaders are doing selective preaching? Yeah, I think sometimes they find their gift and they stick with their gift. If it's storytelling, they just tell a lot of stories, no Testament or New Testament and or or you know, they, they preach around things. You know, there, there are certain hard verses in the, in, that you've just never preached on. I mean, you've done that. You've not preached on them on purpose uh, and and they're selective. And so I guess in the in a positive way, they this very selective of picking out verses that fits their sometimes it's their preaching style and sometimes it's their leadership comfort range. You look, it's it just makes me uncomfortable. You know, I've had guys say I've never I haven't preached on giving in four or five years. Well, the reason they're they're, they're uncomfortable with it. Is a little and one they may not model it or they just feel comfortable, you know, uncomfortable. Well, if God says you're going to be blessed by doing that, well, why would you not? And so I think it's just a lack of courage in some ways, but they just selectively do things that help keep them out of uh, of ever really. It's the old timey way of saying stepping on people's toes, you know, of of trying to reconcile relationships that may. Uh, not be appropriate or um, right. there's several verses we could talk about and chapters we could talk about, but you just do yourself a disservice in your church when you selectively preach. So if you selectively preach as a pastor preacher, you are leading the church to lower expectation. Number three, clearly establishing expectations. Um, I, I know that in, I, I talked last time about Sam's uh, new member class. And um, I talked about how he brings in a lay person to host so that they will, they will hear it. But he actually has a covenantal class and, and he, he gives them a covenant. I don't know how you feel about covenant. So you and I don't prepare on this. So talk to me. Yeah, I, th- I think they're fantastic. I think you have anybody. We're going to hire anybody here at the North American Mission where we, we give them what's called a job description, you know, yeah. <laughs> and there's an expectation agreement. Basically, this is what we expect. And. And to me as a member, and I would want now that I am a member of a church, I want them to say, okay, tell me what you expect. You know, I don't want to just do the minimum, but I do want to know what is the minimum expectation here. Yes. And, and so man, I, I, every church should have a list of now how you enforce all that. That's up to you. But at least to let people know what those expectations and to raise the bar for crying out loud. I mean, I, I just don't want to be a part of a group. People don't want to be a part of, of something because, uh, you know, it's just, you know, you can just join by being there. I mean, there, there's something to be said about that. Something bigger than themselves. Yeah. There's something to be said about that Marine mentality, you know, yes. Marines, man, they're proud to be a Marine. Why? Cause there's higher expectations. And you, you remember Barry Sadler's song, the green beret? No. 1000 men will select today, but only 10 when the green beret. No, I said no, just for the hope you wouldn't sing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, again, the, the Green Beret, the Marine mentality, all of those is, hey, it's a few good people. It is not just anybody. You know, you know there's a great clip out. I, I would encourage it. Uh, I, uh, and I'll throw it to Amy so she could maybe throw it uh, on the show of, of, of Coach Saban talking about a reckoning day. And he talks about the reason he has high expectations in Alabama. He said, my daddy had high expectations. Come five o'clock, he said, it was dinner. We all ate together. And he would slam his uh, hand on the table and say, look, did you do the yard? Did you clean the mower up afterwards? Did you trim that? And I, he would go everything I was supposed to do. And there was a reckoning. And if I didn't do it right, I'd go back and have to redo it. And he goes, what we need are more reckoning days. See, these, these boys have grown up without reckoning at five o'clock. Nobody's holding them accountable. Then I have to. And then, you know, and, but I really think that's true. You know, we, we, we need to have this expectations and people know that, look, you can't just live any way you want and be a Sunday school teacher. You can't live any way you want and be a, a deacon or an elder. You, they're, they're, 
there has to be some expectations. And my word, the church should lead out in that. Oh, and I, I was looking at Sam's expectations, his covenant, and he, he does ask people to sign them as a desire to fulfill. That's how they that's how they do that. And I kept saying these things look familiar. And finally, a few weeks later, I said, where have I seen these? He said, Dad, that's your book. I will. I just copied it from there. <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah, <laughs> I will. I will. I will. And there's a little bit of shameless plug for a book. OK, <laughs> number number four, developing processes of accountability. Leaders mm -hmm. should have accountability or should make, expect other leaders, pastors to staff to have accountability. Leaders should have deacons or elders have accountability. Leaders should have key positions in the church with accountability, like teachers. And many churches are low commitment because the leaders have not established processes of accountability. That, that, that's exactly right. It all starts at the top. And, and you have to have your own sense of accountability, even if say, well, they learned to trust me and they just kind of let me do my own thing. I mean, that's even more reason to instill some accountability uh, so that you show by leadership. Every one of us have a sense of accountability here. And yeah. to me, no one ever needs to be in a position where you don't have some sense of accountability. You, I mean, that would be dangerous. In, in a previous uh, conversation, Kevin, you talked about uh at, at your last church before you came to the North American Mission Board that you established uh, six month reviews. Did you do that six month to get them up to a point and then you go annual or did you just keep the six month review? You know, honestly, we do now at NAM, we have we, we have, a, a you know, the annual review for, uh, you know, HR, but we actually do qu quarterly now. We do 12 weeks and then a week of review and a week to project the next 12 weeks. So it's 48 weeks and you have weeks in between where you're reflecting and then also looking at the next 12. So we found that people are more, more productive if they do it in, in four quadrants instead of, uh, I like that. And I, we love it. And I, uh, it's, we're able to accomplish a lot more instead of saying this, this yearly goal that sometimes they wait till November and try to bust it to hit it by December. And then we're able to compare quarter to quarter and it, you know, it's not a lot of extra meetings. It's just holding people accountable for what is the one thing you want to accomplish in the next 90 days that you have to accomplish that will make the biggest, most significant difference. What's the one thing? All right. And we're going to knock that baby out. And then obviously you have some other goals, but I just think you got to be very intentional. And I think we just, we mean well, but we're not very intentional knocking things out. We're talking with Kevin Ezell. My name is Tom Rayner. This is Revitalize and Replant. We're going through a three-part series. The series is called Leading a Low Commitment Church to Becoming a High Commitment Church. This is episode two. If you missed episode one that gave background information, go back and listen to that. This is talking about leading leaders to higher commitment. And as Kevin has said so well in so many different ways, it does begin with the leadership. Our last point, not an exhaustive list, but our last point on this is hire and call the right way. So the people that you bring on need to be brought on with high expectation mentality as well, or high commitment. Right. You've always done that. I mean, it's, it's, I think you tell a lot about a leader by who they hire and I hire, I, I, I've always intentionally hired up. It's not really real hard because I'm. Oh, I do, too. I do and, too. And you, look, you look on the screen, there's one of them. God, and so, so right. Well, it, it you, you, uh, it makes you stronger if you hire people that are actually have uh, gifts greater than yours. And I like to be a convener of great gifts, pe gifted people and just kind of keep them uh, in the guide rails of where we're headed, cast the overall vision, but then let them run, you know, and, and have the highest capacity people you possibly can. The problem is some guys are just too, in too insecure, too intimidated to do that. And they, they hire down. And, or, 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 you know, they may end up, firing those who are who are really strong because they're intimidated by them you know yeah and they don't want the pushback or the second you know they call it second guessing which my word i want if i can't handle pushback then I'm pretty weak anyway and uh yeah i, I just think and, and i think the, the biggest challenge here is sometimes when you put high capacity leaders i found in in a, in a role um guys feel like they're missing out on getting credit for something or they really do want the credit or the the visible 
accolades that come with someone. If you put somebody in a position, I remember one time I put a, the best Sunday school teacher we had, I put him in charge of Wednesday night Bible study. Yeah. I was going to go out and visit. I put him in. And, uh, man, he did great. And the people, lo- you know, they, they loved him doing it. And he was better at it than I was for crying out loud. And, and people would say that. I remember when Jimmy Scroggins was my student minister. And, you know, I'd have him preach, start preaching on Sunday nights or, and, and all. And they'd say, well, you better watch it. You know, that brother Jimmy, he's really something else. He's a he's a well of a communicator. And, and, and some guys were like, oh, my gosh. But but and I you want to I just want to feel those fires. And and oh. uh, that's that's just a part of it. I think that's the reason people don't, though. They're just a little and insecure and intimidated. Yeah, in- insecure leaders are going to castigate people. They're going to let people go that they're threatened by. They're going to do all of those things. So secure leaders, if they want a higher commitment, church or organization are going to hire and call stronger people instead yeah. of weaker people. Yeah, exactly. And quite frankly, my hiring is to hire to my weakness, to try to complement the areas where uh, I know that I am not strong. Uh, sometimes I miss it and I have to go make the whatever adjustments. And uh, sometimes I get it right. And it makes all the difference in the organization. Absolutely. But th- the key is what you just said. Sometimes you do miss it. I mean, it's not a it's yeah, it's it's more of an art, not a science. Yes. And, and but you you fix it. You don't just deal with it. You fix it for the sake of both of you. So. All right. We will be back for episode three. The, the episode, once again, is leading a low commitment church to becoming a high commitment church. Episode one was background. Episode two was dealing with leaders. In episode three, you probably many of you probably been waiting for episode three, leading members to become high commitment. We felt it was important to give you the background of why church is a low commitment and then talk to you leaders first, but we're finally going to get to the members. So join us next week or whenever you listen to these, you may, you may be binging on uh, revitalize and replant with Kevin Ezell, Tom Rainer, Mark Clifton, but whenever you listen to these, stay tuned for episode three. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be great. Thank you for being at revitalize and replant as always. Again, thank the North American mission board and revitalize and replant.com. And at Church Answers, along with Revitalize and Replant, we will work with you to get churches healthier together.